This is one of our interviews on Rancho Mirage TV, and we've done quite a few. My name is David Bryant. I have the good fortune of being the library director in Rancho Mirage. Very busy, busy library, as most of you know. And today, we have a very, very special guest. Well, let's make it very. The double very is always problematic. Let's make it a very special guest, Patrice Merritt. Patrice has served on our Library Foundation board since 2015, so that's two years, and really knows her way around libraries. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you for having me, David. And there's a reason that Patrice is here today, even beyond our Library Foundation, which is the fundraising arm of the library. And don't worry, this is not going to be a sales pitch for that. <clears throat> this is something even more interesting. Patrice has just completed, and it's just been published by Wayne State University Press, a beautiful book, may I just say, one of the best looking books I've ever seen and probably the best looking book we'll ever see about libraries in America. And it's about the Detroit Public Library. It's history, it's incredible design, and you had a co-author yes, with this. Yes, I did. This. A young woman, I like to think of us as young, um, Barbara Meiji Cohn, who came to me several years ago wanting to implement a talk, walking tour of this magnificent edifice in Detroit. One had not been offered when she inquired. She was told there were none, and she embarked upon a mission to create one. She found me, and the rest is history. We implemented free tours, and... And what year was that? Um, 2013. And I think I read in the intro of this book that, was it 7,600 people took those tours? Yes, to, to date, 7,600 people have taken the tours. These are free tours. But demand became so overwhelming that we finally had to require reservations and booked private tours, which then became a revenue generator for the library. The visuals that are behind us that you're seeing at home, and we'll be moving this along in a minute, these visuals are some of the best I've ever seen of the grand era of public libraries in America. We know our Rancho Mirage Public Library. We love it. We would put it in the category of modern, certainly energy efficient, very carefully designed for who we are now and how we operate. And stacks are not really our centerpiece anymore. Of course, our book collection ultimately is. But this library is about so much more programming, et cetera, meeting spaces. There's a lot going on here. Detroit Public Library, a very different era. Very different. Um, turn of the century, major metropolitan cities were creating libraries of this kind of magnificent edifice look that you see here on the screen. Not only in Detroit, but in Boston at Copley Square, you have a magnificent edifice. In New York, the public library with the lions, patience and fortitude in front. Philadelphia, Enoch Pratt Free Library. These were all cities at this vintage. This was 1917 when it was built. Um, 1921 when it was completed. Um, this was common. It would take years to build these, these buildings, and Detroit was no different. Every one of the buildings that I mentioned has that neoclassical design. The architects all went abroad. We used to refer to it as the grand tour. They would go ab abroad to study classical buildings, classical lines, and then they would come back to America with the ideas and craft them for these buildings. So in New York, you had Carrier and Hastings. In Detroit, you had Cass Gilbert who created this beautiful building. The majesty of this and the iconic power of this in a city like Detroit now, but probably then, tell us about when this building was being designed and then ultimately opened in 1921. This still was a very significant addition to the Detroit landscape, huge was it not cityscape? Huge undertaking. It was placed in an area that the city fathers had designated to be a cultural center. So it was not happenstance that this building was at this location. The city fathers knew they needed some sort of community facility to educate people. You had immigrant people coming to this country in droves at that time. And there was a lot of benevolence that people wanted to be able to educate the masses or the humble masses. So they picked these locations that were very centrally located, although at the time may have been on what would have been the outskirts of the business center. So for example, if you look closely at this image, you'll see two women. And the woman on the right is dressed in finery. The woman on the left appears to be her day maid because she seems to be putting packages into the satchel. So public libraries were part of their daily routine, part of where they would migrate after their shopping or to just parouse and read magazines and newspapers. Remarkable. 
Let's, uh, do we, we have uh, quite a this few, is, oh, um, the construction. So you have to remember in 1921, we didn't have wonderful bulldozers and backhoes. Um, this is just very, very, the, the landscape, digging the hole in, in, a, in essence with horses to take away the mud and steam shovels. This was industrial revolutionary America where we fi finally had steam. Again, this was Detroit where anything that could be mechanized was. And this is winter. This is winter. It. It's, um, it's in <clears throat> yep, 1915. So this was just the start of the dig out. One of the things that we learned as we did this book was that um, Andrew Carnegie was a benefactor. And what we learned about Carnegie is that while he gave money to many libraries across this country, over 1,500 Carnegie libraries exist in the United States, he ca it came with a caveat. He would build the library, the bricks and mortar, but the city would have to acquire the land and then thereafter sustain the edifice and the materials and the staff. So he would build it, but the city then had to maintain it thereafter. Andrew Carnegie had an interesting take on what libraries should look like. And what he actually said was, I want it to look like a library. I had previously directed a library in New Jersey that was a Carnegie library, built in 1911. And the Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City did a wonderful show on uh, Carnegie libraries. 1,500 plus, as you yes. said, in America, and I think another six or 700 in Canada, which people well, don't realize the world. as well. Yep. A remarkable, uh, we were chatting before the camera started rolling, that the city of Detroit, actually, uh, the city of uh, St. Louis was actually given circa 1909, uh, $1 million by Andrew Carnegie, an enormous sum in It's an enormous sum of money. Now, his gift to Detroit was $375,000. $375,000, some of which was allocated for this main library building, and others were for the branches which were to come. When I talked about location, I said oftentimes they were built in areas that were planned to be centrally located. This is the northern end of Detroit. This is the library growing up amongst uh, debris and weeds, but believe me, today this is a hub. This is just a cultural Well, location. it's Woodward Avenue, It's Woodward it? Avenue, right across the street from the Detroit Institute of Art, which was built after the library. So in Detroit, people would always refer to the library as being across the street from the DIA, but on our library tour, we would always insist that that was incorrect. The DIA was across the street from the library. We were here first. And here it comes out of the ground. Again, you have to envision the mechanics to do this. It, it's steel encased, and it is just... I can't begin to describe it. This picture does not do it justice. Well, you're beginning to see the architectural details, though. Right. On that steel skeleton. It's, uh, and here we are in 1918, correct? 1918. So we're about a year in at this point. It took point. six years to build. You know, um, and so the crowning glory of many of Cass Gilbert's buildings are these double bronze doors. Cass Gilbert designed the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. And if you've been to the Supreme Court building, you will see similar doors to this. These feature um, on the left are Roman figures, and on the right are Greek figures. This is a teacher with a pupil. So you would have Herodotus with his pupil, or Sappho talking to his or her pupil. Um, these are 18 feet tall, um, bas relief, designed by a bronze worker out of New York City. What we did discover as we were doing our research of our library was that the same artisans from across the country were doing work similarly on other public libraries of this grandeur. And the uh, statement over the door, in case it doesn't show on camera, is that knowledge is power. Yep. If we could uh, etch something in our copper and atop our doors here in Rancho Mirage, I think it would be lifelong learning. But knowledge is power. It's very and that was Cass Gilbert. Perfect. That was Cass Gilbert's line. Perfect. Here's another vision of, of just the magnitude. I think when you see these buildings on their thoroughfares, you kind of lose the sense of how large they are in scale to the human, to the human being. And um, this was just stunning when we saw it, because we thought, you can describe it in terms of feet, but until you actually see it, it's, it's and these doors would close. Um, at the present time, the doors are permanently open, so we cannot see all of the figures any longer. The, uh, the architectural embellishment, the detail, is just right. incredible. It's as if no image, no shape, no form, no design is enough without further embellishment. Further embellishment. You'll see these rosettes, um, these urns. Um, brass, you'll see stone, you'll see um, wrought iron, 
When we get inside the building, you'll start to see more painting, and you'll see these magnificent ceilings, these beautiful coffered ceilings. This is the main entrance. Um, Cass Gilbert firmly believed in using materials of, of American quality. This is Tennessee pink marble, those columns. The coffered ceiling has that Greek key design. You see that interlocking. Oh, yes. Um, again, something that they took from the European... And so do coffee shops uh, yeah. run by Greeks. They, by the way, they have that on the paper cup. My, uh, our cameraman today, and always our AV technology guru here, is Dustin Ingham, not on camera. Uh, Dustin and I went through some of these slides last week, and we were chatting about, <laughs> particularly the uh, detail on the left, that that could be now cast in resin. Absolutely. So this could be replicated in that, oh, it wouldn't have this, this dynamic, this scale. It wouldn't have this, well, we've said grander a hundred different ways, but it might not have that now. But some of this could be replicated. Surely. It's cast plaster. You know, and these colors are original. This is untouched. This build, this ceiling has not been repainted or touched up at all. Well, one thing uh, I, I think our audience would be interested in, Patrice, and certainly an interviewer here, I would, how well preserved um, has this library, what, what's been the life of this library in recent times? Unfortunately, with the way things are in Detroit, the demise of the tax base, keep in mind that the oh, library yes. millage pays for the maintenance of the library, not just collections, but the actual building. It is not a city department. Um, in Detroit, it is controlled by the Department of Education of the city of Detroit, which was in receivership. So without a property tax millage collected, those are the only resources that this library has to sustain itself, in addition to the funds that were raised by the Detroit Public Library Friends Foundation, which was primarily enrichment activities, not bricks and mortar. Now, what is what has been or was your affiliation with that foundation? Right. I was the executive director of that foundation for approximately 15 years. And like the Rancho Mirage Foundation, we spent a lot of our time raising money for programming, community, um, some money on collections, but nonetheless, enrichment activities that are not supported by our tax dollars are, were the focus of um, our foundation. But infrastructure during that time was not your focus. Not at all. Not at all. Well, in a way, you know, this is, as usual, kind of a crazy opinion, but that isn't the worst thing in the world because it wouldn't get... Um, oh, sheet rocked over, no, or no. let's modernize right, it. Right. New York Public Library, uh, once Mrs. Vanderbilt became involved, because Barton Gregor Gregorian had such an immense personality that he drew her in and she became the principal fundraiser and donor, and they did a major restoration of New York Public some years ago. What they discovered behind some walls mm. were rooms, well, I think the previous photo might have been the better one, but they found um, this kind of architecture, they found this kind of look, early 20th century, the, the powerful architecture of the period, sheet rocked over, oh. turned into, for either energy reasons, someplace that's cheaper and easier to heat and cool, or simply they were, oh, well, that's, that's how they looked then. We don't want our library to look like that now. But it sounds like Detroit escaped that we kind did. of, uh, really a reduction of its, of its powerful look. But how could you not feel special walking into an edifice like that on, on just free? Let's keep in mind, our public libraries are there, open to all, welcoming all. And Certainly is, inspiring. Indeed. And you think of immigrants, the, uh, the images of New York Public Library welcoming immigrants and, and also during the Great Depression. New York Public Library was so busy during the Great Depression that people were sitting on tables. This room has about 20 chairs in it. It's not really a representative library room, but if it were, every seat would be occupied and some people might be sitting at the ends of the table. Well, it was, it was interesting, upon the completion of this building in 1921, um, the then library director, Adam Strom, was pleading with the city five years later for more space, that people came and it was this, the lines were deep, the staff was overwhelmed. So it was 1926 he was looking for more space and they didn't do an addition until 1963. So, um, to your point, the library was the hub of the community at that time, as it is today. We have not lost the focus on our mission in that regard. And children were always a focus. This is um, one of the earliest images of the, of the library. The work is not even done yet, as you will see later. But notice that these are children of uh, teen age as well as young age. 
Today's libraries, as you know, have children's rooms for children and teen sites for teens, and you, you graduated to the adult section at some point. But here we are right at the start of the library with, I'm sure it was staged, but I'd like to point out that there is a, there's a floor there that is herringbone, but it happens to be cork because oh. children are loud and noisy, so they needed to keep the noise down. Now, has that been preserved? Uh, no, that is covered over. That is covered over. This room now is a teen center, which um, has limitations that it only opens after school is closed, and the teens have their own cards, and adults such as us would not be allowed in there between certain hours. When we would do library tours, we would have to excuse ourselves and say to the teens, may we come in and invade your space. Notice knickers and neckties. Knickers and neckties. Um, this fireplace, which you see here in black and white, um, is a distinctly Detroit tradition. This is done by a pottery in Detroit known as Poabic Pottery, founded by a, a lady, Mary Chase Perry Stratton, an entrepreneur. And the thing that is very notable about Poabic is the glazes. You will see this iridescent shimmer to the glazes. These are fairy tales, um, Pocahontas, Hansel and Gretel, The Tin Soldier. I think I see Bullwinkle up there on <laughs> the... Uh, on the well, That's a just... Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh. <laughs> um, it is a focal point. When people walk into this facility and they see this Poabic fireplace, they just stand there in awe. This was a gathering spot for children. You can see that they had a smaller bench area, which has been removed. But um, the artisan work here, one of the things in the book that we really wanted to stress was the craftsmanship. And this clearly was um, probably the piece, which you will see later replicated in other areas. Um, here it is again, but prior to this, this is a map of the two peninsulas of Michigan. I like to point that out. Frederick Wiley worked with Cass Gilbert to do design elements, and Wiley felt that children learned visually, so it was important to create a map so that the children could understand the history of the so state. It's one from. of the most beautiful. I, I think of it as a mural, but I don't know whether that's correct or not, but it's a piece of art. It is absolutely magnificent. Every, every big city and every state should have such a map. But there are distinctly, you know, Michigan things there. To the right of it, we, we, we tell the children, this is a wonderful um, I Spy um, thing on the tour for children. To the right, you'll see elegant gardens, which represent the French who came from France to move to Michigan. So their left is very primitive. You see jackrabbits and Native Americans and birch huts, as opposed to the Grand Garden of Versailles that they left. Beautiful. It's it's. We could spend an hour on a tour. Just to the to Upper Peninsula there. and all of Michigan. And the lakes. And now we progress into more, I don't even, I know the word grandeur keeps coming up, but the barrel vaulted ceiling up on the third floor. The third floor was dedicated to classical literature, the performing arts and music. And so once again, you're led up this staircase to symbolism that we cannot begin to define. You will find throughout the building signs of the zodiac being replicated. Um, books closed, meaning um, access to knowledge not yet discovered. Books open, meaning the words that have been learned. It's, it's truly throughout the building just. When we see those magnificent paintings, are they painted into the uh, infrastructure? Or yes, were they, they are into the infrastructure. It's a good point. Right on the plaster. Right on the plaster. And it's a good point to mention because during Detroit's bankruptcy, which occurred at the time we were writing this book, many people would come to us um, asking if our art was safe because the Detroit Institute of Art was being forced or consideration was given to oh, selling yes. art. That was national news. National news. So people would come to us and say, well, what's going to happen to your art? And so we, how much would this be? Yeah, how much could we sell this for? Um, we said, well, they can't just tear it off the wall because it's part of the Hardly. infrastructure. So we were safe. This is letters. Um, there are two murals, poetry and letters. And if you look in the upper left corner, you'll see um, Shakespeare. Oh, yes. Now, is, were these uh, paintings restored? or They've they not been restored. Oh. Um, they are bright here. They do need work because you have to remember in the time that the library was built there was no air conditioning so windows were open out to the public area and people smoked oh. so you Those have years and years of dust and dirt and surprising the whites are as white as they are and they have a yellow from that but the colors are truly magnificent painted glass windows as opposed to stained glass windows um, throughout the building 
And this one on my right, you can see the start of the mural at the top of it. So as you come on a landing, your landing is being lit by these magnificent painted windows. So what you have there, is that a cast iron uh, yes. frame? Yes, yes. And you can see the larger portions of that. And the rest, so the framing, but the rest of it is painted, painted on the glass. Painted on the glass. And has, uh, is still there. It's still there. 1921 to almost Nothing's 100 broken. years. Nothing. Almost 100 um, years. Lovely quote at the bottom, Labor of Vinces. Through labor, you will conquer. Sounds like a very good Detroit quote, doesn't it? <laughs> sure does. And a manufacturing city with a lot of muscle. Right. Um, this was interesting to many of our residents. The ceiling, that barrel vaulted ceiling, contains four seals. One is the Great Seal of the United States of America. One is the Great Seal of the State of Michigan. One is the Seal of the City of Detroit. And the Seal of the University of Michigan. So all of our Wolverine fans were thrilled to see it on the ceiling, much to the dismay of the Michigan State fans. The University of Michigan got its start in Detroit. Its first location was the city of Detroit, and it didn't move to Ann Arbor until later. But it just goes to show that Cass Gilbert and Wiley wanted very much for the community to feel a sense of who owned this library, who created this library. So not only national, local, but also regional. And these are huge in the ceiling. These are now, what was your source for these photographs? These were available through the library um, or through no, the foundation? No, quite, quite frankly, um, some of the historical photographs we certainly took from the library archives. But during the tour, we would have numerous people ask me, we take pictures. And we always said, surely. And then as we came upon the idea of a book, we were thinking, well, how are we going to capture it through today's modern eyes? And we asked the photographers um, if they would be willing to donate their photography, and they did. And they're very well represented yes, in this are. book. I saw them toward the uh, rear of the book. Nicely done. And they Just came. Just a beautiful they, book, really, a beautiful effort. They ranged from professional photographers to a Cub Scout mom who was in the building bringing her cubs, cubbies through the building. Um, this happens to be my favorite image um, of all. This is called The Joining of the Ways. And again, Frederick Wiley and Cass Gilbert wanted to tell history through this very, very public building. To the left, you see a young person holding a rope. And if you look further into the image, there's water and a boat. That represents the navigation of the Great Lakes and the waterways. To the right, you see someone with a wheel representing migration now to industrialization, machinery, and how the two ways will now join and can continue to create an economy for the state of Michigan. The lovely maiden with the wings is um, holding in her lap a shield with, this, with the city of Detroit symbol upon it. So it, it truly is crafted to tell a story. And is she an angel? Because I see angel wings. You see angel wings. She's overseeing this joining. She's giving it her blessing. The, the halo effect looks like it's mosaic, looks like it would be tile. Each one is individually painted. So again, these weren't buildings that we threw up. We kind of crafted everything on site. Um, these murals were painted elsewhere and then finished in the building. So they were started in a gal in, in um, Ardorente, began them, and then brought them to the library to finish. Well, how? How would that work? On canvas? On canvas. Oh, so then the canvas is on top Pure. of the uh, plaster. Ah. Right. So you see my favorite oh, above the top. So and that's the, the cover of the book as well. Yes, it is. To the left, um, again, this is the third floor where there's music and art and literature. So to the left is a mural um, with depicting music. The lady in red is opera. The lady with the bare feet represents dance. The lady with the sort of coquettish pose is lyric opera or, or drama. You see a choir master, and if you look very, very carefully, you'll see faces of choir boys along the side. And St. Helen, the patron saint of music, is at the top. Did this building, when designed, when, when opened, when built, uh, have elevators? Yes, it had one eleva two elevators that are still I hate to say it, still the original operating elevators. Well, parts are getting difficult. <laughs> but it must have been a, a pretty basic physics or a pretty basic design that they were using to keep going. It was Again, strong as can be and good metallurgy, certainly in that era. And hopefully. had operators. Oh, uh, yes. Remember elevator Third operator. floor, poetry, <laughs> fiction, uh, sports. <laughs> Um, Adam Strom was one of the directors, and this is an entryway into what was the delivery room in the oldest sense of um, libraries. 
Again, I want you to notice that embellishment carved into the stone, the same Florida Lee design everywhere. And then this is the room when it was first built. Those windows at that time were not yet painted. They were oh. naked. They had, not been, they had not been installed or the work had not been done. So the way this worked oops, is you would get a piece of paper, find what you needed, give it to the librarian, and a mnemonic tube system was installed oh, in the yes, library. Oh, yes, yes. Department so, stores, of course, had, correct, had that. Correct, that would be our Banks use. still have that from some of the drive-up windows. That's right. And that's how materials were then delivered to the patron in this room. This room is 36 by 36. And that librarian had a lot of sway in that room. That librarian was <laughs> treated, did. I'm sure, with great respect and, in some cases, fear. Yes, but this is... They, this were is very, they were very serious people. The lights that you see there are still there. I mean, this was very traditional. I don't oh, care very. what library you this, were in. This has a New York Public Library. Absolutely. This actually had a train station look to it. Right. I mean, it had that feel of that time period. And here it is again um, with, with some of the painted glass windows uh. installed. And I'm sad to say that those particular windows were covered over when they did the addition in 1963. And we're not sure if they're still there, um, but they are no longer visible. Um, they're we, covered over inside and outside? We, yes. We, mm. um, we, we need had some x-ray equipment. We need a sonogram to come into yes. the picture. And here is um, another wonderful image taken by one of our free photographers. And if you look across the top, there is a Cass Gilbert quote that says, the most enduring monument of man is um, through civilization is reading, or words to that effect. And there are four quotes that surround the um, cornice. Beautiful. Um, I told you the windows were painted over. This is what was put in its place, a modern version of the history of transportation. <sighs> What else could Detroit do but do a history of transportation? This was done by a Michigan artist and um, another I spy for children. You see on the left the very primitive um, Model T horse and buggy. To the far right, you see the evolution of the steam engine. Therefore, you're starting to see lumbering in the upper peninsula of Michigan coming down. And then in the middle, rocketry is how it's referred to. But yes, we lost beautiful windows. It's almost cartoon on, on the two sides and then uh, the sense of a big government in the center when you see yes. WPA. Well, the Soviet murals were incredible in posters. They all had that strong man kind of look to them. And, and the image is almost frightening if you can see it in person in its scale because this is literally a giant. Some children are literally frightened when they see this human being, especially because the hands are so outreaching. They're almost afraid that he's going to come out of the wall and scoop them away. Um, these are some of the images we use as build out to sort of demonstrate cast plaster ceilings and how they were being done. Remarkable. And then that was 1920, that photo. Right, and here's the finish. Again, not in color, but um, you will see those Pocket doors, those double closing doors are pocket doors, which are still used to this day. And we haven't even talked about all the wood trim that is. No, we've not. We're talking about the stone and, and plaster. And again, um, herringbone floors of cork for sound. Um, this is a, a piece of that ceiling. I'd like to go back and sort of show you that medallion. Oh, yes. The medallion then became <clears throat> this. This is another mural, Solomon preaching wisdom to the legislature. This room was known as the civics room, a word we don't hear very often anymore. And here we have Solomon preaching wisdom. We can bring that into the 21st century world. Yeah, we could use a little of that. And then again, another construction photo to sort of share with you the guts. And there it is today. Um, the lights are original. And across the top of the ceiling alcoves are images from Aesop's fables. Again, Frederick Wiley designed stories, literature throughout this building. Well, not to get too caught up on the money as usual, but is there sufficient funding for this library now, Detroit Public Library, to be able to maintain this? Barely. Barely. The roof was replaced at a cost of $5 million about five years ago. But if you don't have the roof in place, forget about what's inside. Exactly. So it's one of those things that's not necessarily the sexiest thing that a donor wants to pay for, but nonetheless, it's the quintessential thing to keep the collections intact and the building and usable. And the building as well. Here's um, some of Aesop's fable. This is the, stock, the stork and the fox, where they're invited to dinner, and the 
stork serves the fox in beakers where the fox can't eat. So then the fox invites the stork to dinner and puts food on a flat platter so that the stork cannot eat, hence the moral of the story. <laughs> Um, this is another beautiful entryway um, with what we now call the Yellen Gate. Um, this is an outdoor loggia. This is seven arches replicating Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man, done in mosaic tile, starting with infancy and ending in decrepitude. So you're born, you live, you become a warrior, you get older, you, have, you go through old age, but ultimately it's decrepitude. Thank you. It's, um, and as you all remember, Shakespeare's All the World's a Stage, the men and women merely players, taken from As You Like It, it is inscribed here in the tile. How many stories tall was that image, the, the loge? The, this would be, the building is an impression of, seven, of, of four stories, and it's really seven. So this would have been the third floor. The building extends up 350 feet, if I'm correct. 350 feet from ground? To yes. Keep in mind there's it's a- It's enormous. It is enormous. Here's more of the loggia. Um, and we, we put this slide in the book because at the bottom you can see the Cass Gilbert yes. architect signed his building. And it's 1909 in Roman numerals, one of my favorite things, to yes. 1919. But it actually opened 1921. 21, when it was completed. And here it is at Oh, night. love it. Taken from across the street. And that would have been from the era of the cars, late 40s, maybe 1950. Right. which then led us into the new um, edition. And here's the groundbreaking. Um, keep in mind, this was approved by our common council in Detroit, and we actually had a woman leader on that common council. Well, that and, woman's got a serious shovel of dirt there. And I give her all the credit in the world with her <laughs> open-toed shoes, her swanky hat, and sunglasses. And here's the actual build out. They had to take the porticos off three sides of the building. So you start to see, I mean, there was land. They had acquired the land when, when Carnegie built the library. But now we're starting to see the modernity. Here are those beautiful arches in the entryway during build out. What astonishes me in this photo is that no one thought to cover the lights or to even use another light. They just left them there. And the wall was knocked through to what became a back entrance, or the, what we call the cast entrance to the library. And here it is in its mid-century modern design. Oh, beautiful mid-century modern image. Absolutely beautiful. Cass Gilbert's son, Cass Gilbert Jr., and Francis Keeley were the architects um, hired to create this. And here is um, one of our reading rooms. How do you, as an expert on that library, and certainly you were there for all those years, how was the marriage of the mid-century modern with that uh, classical? It, you clearly know that you've left something special to go into something that is functional. So it isn't warm and fuzzy um, at all, but it's functional. It's easier to clean. It moves people much more easily than the previous building did. But that was the thinking. This was 1964, I think I saw on the previous slide. This. I think the thinking was, this is what it looks like now, so we'll take pride in it, and this is how it shall be. And that's what it looked like then, and we'll keep it dust-free, hopefully. Right. Mm -hmm. And let the, two, uh, let the two not compete, but certainly at least function together, as you said. And here it is today. So it gets a little warmer when you add a little carpeting. Well, and... they've changed the furniture around. Yeah. That, that furniture product is... Very easy to see at the American Library Association conferences right. each year. That vendor is pretty well known. And then this was the, uh, you can start to see now the old building. If you look at the top, you see that cornice work. Mm -hmm. um, white Vermont marble on the outside of the old building. Cass Gilbert wanted the sun to reflect upon the building. And then when they added the wing, they did additional white Vermont marble, but not so much. It was not the same quality, nor does it have the same glistening effect. Now you've got WDET, is that right? Radio in the station, public, public radio. Public radio out of Wayne State University. And this is another magnificent mural, a mosaic, that is at the rear entrance of the building. Um, again, done by a California artist. And it it's, replicates the river of knowledge. If you look at it carefully, you'll start to see quotes, again, from the great classical minds, a few more 21st century, 20th century minds, but it is the river of knowledge done, and I believe, I can't remember the amount of tiles, but once again, 
Like the loggia, every tile was hand laid in place. Whoops. And I think that's, and here it is in um, upright version of the red, which was really um, that's sort a of surprise. contrary to even the, even the mid-century modern. Very. Yeah. It's a surprise. That color is absolutely in that photo. And in reality, I'm sure that's a surprising choice. I mean, it works at some level. But when you just think they'd go in the grays or uh, the red is this, this. And this is sort of the last image that I like because people always. cell phone. Well, people always <laughs> ask us, what's today's library like? What, we don't need libraries, or do we? And here we have a young person on his handheld device, still surrounded by beautiful art. The building is still utilitarian, despite what everyone thinks today as being obsolete. And that's why I, I thought this image was um, very pertinent for phase three. And I just bring you back here. Cass Gilbert's quote, public buildings best serve the public by being beautiful. Well, a great slideshow, Patrice. An absolutely beautiful book. And we're not really here to sell Patrice's book, but uh, it is recommended reading. We certainly will have it in our collection. Patrice was kind enough to sign a copy and give it to our library. But a great story and a representative story. Very representative, not only of Detroit, but other great cities. I know, I know you like my favorite quote, this is a grand building in a great city. But that can be said That's of the summary. But that would be Chicago. Chicago. That would be New York public. Absolutely. That would be. I don't know about west of the Mississippi. I guess that might have been the case. But it seems as if that's an earlier time. It really is an earlier I, time. I think the thing that, that brought all of them together also was the benefactors that made this happen. You know, it wasn't just Carnegie. In New York, you had um, the Tildens and in Enoch Pratt, who did oh, yes. Baltimore. Baltimore. And so there were these, these, these people that were making a lot of money at that time we're giving back to their communities in grand ways. I think Enoch Pratt was over a million dollars that was given at that time, not only to build the library, but to help endow it as well. Well, the Andrew Carnegie story to me is still fascinating because he remained a rich man. He did. And he had a battle with, and I'm trying to think who the other industrialist was, about who would have the longer yacht, steel-hulled yacht. And they were almost to the point of mine is three feet longer than yours. But there was that kind of competitiveness and that kind of capitalism and that kind of success and money making, et cetera, and labor and those issues. But the gift that Andrew Carnegie gave in terms of uh, contemporary dollars, I don't think will ever never, be replicated. Never. Now, the, the, certainly uh, Bill and Melinda Gates have given a fortune in any era, uh, by any measure, to health issues and education issues, et cetera. But I think Carnegie's gift is just, it is the one. Well, those gifts one. impacted the general population, these library gifts, to this day. Perfect. Andrew Carnegie's Detroit story was a little bit unique. It took the city of Detroit and its city fathers 10 years to accept his very generous gift because the people felt that it was sweat equity, money earned off the laborer of the steel mills that were overseen by Mr. Carnegie, and they thought the money was tainted. But Civic-minded people finally came and got straight and took the money from Mr. Carnegie, and the rest is history. The library was built. But there must have been many private benefactors to have built this library. The city fathers did um, incorporate some of the early lumber money that was known for Michigan. Michigan today, people just think it was um, automotive money. But truly, in its early days, it was lumber money from the northern upper peninsula and the northern parts of the state. But in most cities, there was usually one significant benefactor. And um, Detroit's major benefactor was Andrew Carnegie. Is this library busy now, Detroit Public Library? It's busy for different reasons. It is the place in Detroit where families come because they do not have computers at home. They do not have technology to learn how to use technology. Um, story hours, which we all kid about, children still love to be read to. Summer reading programs are still abundant, not only at the main library, but in the branches. There are still 21 branches in the city that operate throughout the summer. I won't say it's busy, but it is also adjacent to Wayne State University. So in many ways, it's absorbed as part of that campus life as well. 
And again, with the Art Institute across the way, there's a lot of cross-pollination with the oh, sure. cultural institutions that are nearby. Do the, um, I mean, now we're into sort of technicalities. Please forgive us. But our library, for instance, uh, any California resident can have a library card in the Ranch Mirage Public Library. How would Detroit be in Michigan does, does not necessarily do that. In Detroit Public Library, you have to be a resident of the city of Detroit to take materials out. Anybody yes. can come in and use the, the facility. But you can do interlibrary loan still in Detroit, but they would charge anybody else for a library card. If you're a student in the city of Detroit and don't live in the city, that's fine. Be you a college student or a public school student. And if you work in the city of Detroit, um, you are allowed to obtain a library card as well. And they're all indicated that you are a resident or a worker or a student. So there are some borrowing restrictions. Well, it's interesting, Patrice, that you have your Detroit life and now you have your Rancho Mirage life. Which I'm enjoying immensely because this facility reminds me in many ways of what a great thing a public library is. And um, I understand with 300 children in your library yesterday, um, summer reading and library use is alive and well amongst the families of Rancho Mirage. And hats off to you. Uh, Rancho Mirage and environs when it comes to kids. <laughs> Our city's median age is 63, and uh, I feel most fortunate to exceed that by several years. But your decision, you and Grady, to come here full time, I think was just fabulous. And your book is incredible. Wish you great luck with it. The fact that it exists is what must please you the most. You and your co-author, Barbara Maggi, Maggi? Maggi Cohn. Maggi yes. Cohn. Remarkable work and what a contribution to libraries generally, but especially to the city of Detroit. We what hear a that great a lot. contribution. We hear that and, and people that have seen the book have said, I would have never have guessed this of Detroit. So that was part of our, of our reason to do this. Um, as I said earlier, we were writing this book in the middle of the bankruptcy, so it was doom and gloom every day, national news, local news, as if nothing good could ever come out of Detroit. Well, we like to think that something really grand well, is in Detroit. I think, I mean, as a more than interested um, observer, because I've always been interested in cities and their fate, et cetera, um, we each have our favorite city that we sort of keep an eye on. Detroit was certainly getting plenty of national press. I can't always say good, but, for instance, Dave Bing, mm -hmm. former NBA star, became mayor, mayor for a dollar a year, what, giving his darndest to try to make the thing right. work, try to resurrect what was there. Is there a renaissance going on downtown? There is in, in, in certain areas. Certainly downtown Detroit is booming. An area known as Midtown is becoming a booming area, which is very close to where the library is located. So there's this link from what was the cultural center where D the library is toward downtown, which, by the way, remember, is bordered to Canada by a river. We are an international city because oh, Detroit is split right. with the Detroit River. Um, and then light rail just opened in Detroit, um, perhaps as short, about two months ago. Very limited scale, but um, light rail is going up and down Woodward Avenue in front of the library. But the neighborhoods are still devastated. And I speak from that because those library branches are located in those neighborhoods throughout the city. And the way that they're surviving is they, we, the library administration has picked maybe four that are larger branches that sort of are centrally located and may stay open more hours and then has closed other branches and let's just say less habitable neighborhoods or neighborhoods where there's very, very little population yeah. due to devastation. It's, a, it's an interesting study. If you're an urbanist, Detroit is a large square miles, it's very large, and there's a lot of room to grow, but a lot of room for doom and gloom as well, unfortunately. But that library system is still going strong. Well, you've made your contribution to it and to our Rancho Mirage TV archives and to our broadcast life. So this uh, interview hopefully will be seen by many. We hope you enjoy it and you'll tune in again. And this is David Bryant, library director, and Patrice Merritt. Thank you so Thank you, much David. for being with us. Thank you so much.